And this is a story that happened two Fridays ago. Two Fridays ago, I picked up the phone to call somebody that I know, a, a, a man who's not actually not a Jewish man, but a very, very kind, wonderful, wonderful person in his 70s. I've worked with him a lot. He's a college professor and a very, very prestigious, um, very well-respected, and one of the kindest, kindest, goodest people I know in terms of you know his, 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 his gentle nature and his kind nature. A very, very wonderful person. I called him on, on a business matter. Tells me, He's recovering from surgery, but he's doing well. So I said, oh, tell me a little bit about it. What, what, was, it, what was the matter? What, what, what's the story? So he tells me that for the last, already about three years, he's been suffering terribly from, um, from, from, from a medical issue. It was of somewhat of a delicate nature, so I'm not going to go into it over here. But a medical issue which was really very, very difficult for him for the last three years, and it makes sleeping very difficult, and it makes, excuse me, using the restroom very, very difficult. And it it made his life very hard, and the prospects of how to deal with it were not very encouraging. He went to quite a few doctors, and everybody was like, well, we can do surgery, but the surgery is going to be pretty radical, and it'll mean that you're going to have to have this, you're going to have to have that. It would mean that he'd have to have tubes in his body for, for the rest of his life. It, he just wasn't really ready for all that. But at the same time, he said, isn't there some way to help me that I don't have to go through all this? And they pretty much said, no, there's nothing else. These, these are your options. You know, we tried medication. It didn't help. We tried it. It didn't help. Now we're going to have to do surgery. It's going to be a radical surgery, but this is what it is. He didn't want to do it. So he was holding out. In the meantime, his mother-in-law is really, really not doing well. She is a very elderly woman, very elderly in her. She, she's over 100, something like 101, 102, he told me. And she was not entirely, entirely clear, but, you know, well enough. Didn't live near he and his wife at all. But they would often go visit her. And then it became fairly clear they got a call. It became fairly clear that she is definitely on her last legs. And they don't know how long it's going to be, but she, she's on her final journey. So he told his wife, we need to go take care of your mother. And his wife says, but Tom, how are we going to do it? You know, you're, you're, you're teaching for the college, and it's so difficult, and, you know, we need the money, and I'm working. And he says, this is what we got to do. This is your mom. And we got to take care of your mom, because she deserves it. We're, we're her children, and she deserves it. We go take care of her. And how long do you want to go for? He says, I want to go for as long as she needs. We're going to be with her till the very end, because that's what we need to do. Now, of course, his wife was super appreciative, and it was her mother but the chesed, the kindness that he did for this woman was unbelievable. And I said to him, Tom, did your mother-in-law know you were there? He said, most of the time she didn't. didn't matter. We were with her the entire time. I said, how long were you there? He tells me three weeks we were there. Three weeks to take off from his job. Three weeks for his wife to take off from her job. Not Pasha. Not Pasha. He has a very senior, senior faculty position. Not Pasha to take off. And it wasn't like it could make any difference. He was just there with her, providing support, providing comfort. She ultimately passed. But he told me something very fascinating. He says before she passed, she had a hospice nurse there who was a very, very wonderful person, a very wonderful woman. And this hospice nurse noticed that he was suffering a lot of discomfort and he was constantly excusing himself. And she said to him, Tom, what's going on with you? You don't look like you're doing so well yourself. And he shared with her his saga, what he's going through medically. And she says, Tom, I know a doctor who is a big, big expert in this field, in this particular area. I don't know if he has a better solution, but if anybody would, he's the guy who knows what to do. I'm going to make you an appointment with him. Would that be okay? And Tom was like, oh, sure, I'll do anything. Give me somebody, sure. And she made him an appointment. It was, you know, in his home state, but not in his hometown. It required a drive of a number of hours. And he went to this doctor, and the doctor met with him and examined him and everything. And the doctor said to him, look, Your problem is very clear. The solution, as you by now know, is not a very great one. He says, but it happens to be that there is a there is a procedure that can be done where we can do the surgery and it can be far less radical. And we can preserve this organ and not only preserve it, we can shrink all of the swelling that's taking place in this organ and put you back to normal. The problem is, Tom, I don't do it on adults. I do it on children. I do pediatrics. I don't do it on adults. 
But I do know her. I do, I do have a friend, and he is one of the only doctors who performs this surgery on adults. Let me see if I can get you in touch with him. He's out, I believe it was in the Mayo Clinic. And he's there, and let me see if I can talk to him and if he can take on your case. And long story made short, that is what happened. His friend took on the case, and I was now, I happened to have called him, first time I've spoken to him in a while, I happened to have called him, and he was recovering from the surgery and doing beautifully, and he says, I feel like a new man, a new lease on life, you know. Um, I, I can't believe how wonderful this was. I can't believe how this worked out. And, of course, because he doesn't think the way a yid thinks, he didn't think this way, but I said to him, Tom, do you appreciate what happened over here? Do you understand? You thought you were going to take care of your mother-in-law. This wasn't just serendipitous. Oh, it happens to people who were there. No, you thought you were going to take care of your mother, only you didn't realize that when you go to help another person, you're not going to help that person. You're going to help yourself. And that's why you are the ultimate beneficiary. Yes, your mother only was a beneficiary, but you were the ultimate beneficiary from your act of kindness. He had not thought of that, of course. He was like blown away. But we know, when you know that there's a master plan, when you know there's a Rabbani Shalom, who's a Bairi, who's a Monagas, Kolabriyas, the Rabbani Shalom is taking care of everybody, then you know you don't have to worry about it. If you put your dollar into this soda machine, a soda's going to come out. If it doesn't come out from this soda machine, the Rabbani Shalom make it come out from some other soda machine. You're not going to lose what you shouldn't lose. And you're not going to do a Maisa Chesed and not get back what you should get. And very often what you get is what you gave. Maybe it takes some time. Maybe they'll do for you when you're old. And when you need help, your children will remember what you did. So maybe they didn't talk to you at the Shabbos table. But in 50 years from now, because they hate when you need a little bit of extra help, you don't all be happy to come in and move in and say, I remember what mommy did for me when I had my first kids and how good she was and how kind she was and how she did everything so beautifully. I don't know. But I do know this. You know, you could say something. You could. I wouldn't. I really, really wouldn't. 